perhaps trying to bite off too much into one sermon, but uh, we'll continue and, and conclude uh, this lesson this afternoon. And I appreciate everyone for being back. And I think it's, a, it's an important study, and uh, if you're interested in more detailed study, I can uh, perhaps recommend some books uh, that you might be interested in reading uh, on this level. Um, and, uh, and then just uh, some more personal study. Uh, perhaps the, the best way to get to, that, to know certain things is just to, to, to read and to study more from the Bible uh, in, in regards to these things. This morning we looked at how we can determine whether a thing is right with God or not, whether we should do it or whether we should not do it, whether we must do it, whether we have permission to do it, whether we're prohibited from doing it. All these things are included in what we looked at this morning as direct statements, uh, which can include statements that command or uh, 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 demand that we do something. Uh, they might uh, encourage us to do something. They might permit us to do something. Uh, but we have authority that way uh, given to us through those statements. They may be prohibitive in, in uh in nature, you sh you can't do these things. We also looked at examples, and we pointed out that some folks don't uh, like the uh, the use of examples as binding. But when we look through the Bible, we see Jesus Himself in John 13 verse 15 saying, "I did these things to leave you an example." And Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, "Imitate me as I imitate Christ." So Paul taught by example. Jesus taught by example. And uh, we used some examples this morning to show that we have not just uh, commands that are bound that we are to, uh, to participate in like the Lord's Supper upon every first day of the week and that we are to uh, use the, uh, uh, the the grape juice and the unleavened bread as instruments as part of the Lord's Supper. Those are uh, permitted but also commanded and they are limiting. They are limited to those because we have no other command or no other example of anything or any other day being used. We also looked at some examples that permit but don't just don't necessarily exclude. We might uh, consider uh, Paul, when he went to preach the gospel to all the world and, and he was obeying the Great Commission, well, sometimes he walked. Sometimes he took a boat. The, uh, the obligatory matter was go, right, to all the world and preach the gospel. And we'll look at that in just a moment. The matter, the means by which he got there was not of God's interest. He just wanted him to go. Whether he went by foot or by boat or today we might take a car or boat, <laughs> depending on... Whatever means you want to take, we might take a plane. Uh, we talked about sending financial uh, aid to, to, from one congregation to another. You can send it by two brethren, or you can send it by mail. Those things weren't the obligatory matter. Uh, the, they, were, um, they were what we might refer to as incidental or expedience, and we'll get into that in just a moment as well. Uh, Jonah was told to go, right? You'll remember in Jonah chapter 1. God told Jonah to go, but he didn't tell him how to go. He didn't give him a specific way to go. Uh, Jonah originally got on a boat and went 180 degrees in the wrong direction. Uh, then in uh, Jonah chapter 3, God comes to him again after he had uh, he'd got, uh, he'd got a trip he wasn't expecting. Uh, he didn't take boat or, uh, or car. He got vomited out of a whale. Uh, he took a trip he wasn't expecting. But then God said, go again. And God, once again, didn't say how to go. Uh, it seems that Jonah walked. It said it was a three days journey or a long journey uh, through Nineveh. It was a big city. But it seemed that, Nineveh, uh, that Jonah walked. So the method which was taken was not what was commanded. And that's important to note, too, that we not bind something that God did not bind. That we only bind the obligatory matter. And that was to go. God commanded Jonah to go. God commanded us to go and to preach the gospel to every creature. And whether we use car or uh, boat or plane, that wasn't the, uh, the obligatory matter. 
So then that leads us to implication. And when, when, when I define implication, I like to refer to it as implication because it, it's God's doing. Uh, you may hear people say necessary inference, which is just as equally important. Uh, inference, though, is our responsibility, what we infer from reading the scripture. I like to refer to it as implication because I can't infer it unless God implied it. Now, there's a lot of people out there inferring all many things. They infer a lot from the Bible that's not there. So uh, those inferences are not binding at all. In fact, they don't prove anything or they're not given any authority to anything. I can only infer what God has implied. In other words, I shouldn't make God say something he's not saying. But implication is just as binding or authoritative as an explicit statement or an example. In that, implication is an inescapable logical conclusion that may not be explicitly stated, but it is of necessity true based upon what God has told us. Okay? So, uh, let's say we're taking a geometry class. Okay? Charles used to teach math. He might have better examples, but for our simplicity... Let's say that, uh, or this, let's say uh, geometry, algebra, we'll put all these together. Uh, if, uh, if, if I were to give you the, the problem A plus B equals C, okay, then uh, you might say, well, that was what I explicitly said. That's the problem, A plus B equals C. Then I might add, what can you infer from that? Or better yet, what have I implied in that statement? Well, some people might say, well, we shouldn't infer anything from that, right? We should just take it at face value. Well, you can't. <laughs> you can't just take it at face value because certain things are true based on what I've said. If A plus B equals C, then C is greater than A, right? So I could go out and just as boastfully, or not boastfully, but just as boldly say C is greater than A and C is greater than B. Because A plus B equals C. That means A and B must be less than C. Now, that wasn't explicitly told to me, was it? But I know it, and I know it to be true, just as true as A plus B equals C. Okay? So I infer that based upon the necessity of the facts given to me. Now, if someone were to give me a, a, a geometry uh, question and say, well, we're going to give you a square. And, of course, I'm... By square, I mean a flat geometric plane, so it's not like 3D or, or a cube. It's, a, it's a, just a flat square. And the person says the, uh, the perimeter of the square is 24 inches. Well, I know explicitly stated is I have a square that, with a perimeter of 24 inches. And somebody say, well, what else do we know about that square? And some people say, well, we, we can't know any more about that square than what was explicitly stated. But we can, can't we? I know the definition of, square, of a square means that it's a four-sided uh, uh, shape and all sides are equal. <laughs> right? So if that's the case, then a perimeter 24 means that it's a four sides with six-inch sides. Now that wasn't told me explicitly, was it? But I know it to be true, just as true as the statement itself, based upon it inference. I also know that uh, 6 times 6 is 36. That means the, the area of the square is 36. That wasn't told to me explicitly, but I know it, and I know it to be true. And it's just as true as the original statement. I know that this square has four 90-degree angles. Nobody told me about the degree of angle, did they? But I know it, and I know it to be just as true as the original statement. Why? Because of necessity... Those truths that were given to me explicitly demand these other things to be true. And if one of those things is not true, then the original statement is not true. You see what I'm saying? So let's look at a Bible example. Now this is real world. So if somebody says, no, that's just Church of Christ teaching about you know, how we bind things and they use inference and stuff. No, I was using math and geometry and uh, things of that nature, right? Uh, and we can use it with any real world, how we, how we reason our way through life. But in the Bible, Acts chapter 9, 
just one example. Acts chapter 9, and this is a very important example because I'm sure uh, Kevin in, in our study of the book of Acts will point out some of these things. But in Acts chapter 9, verse 18, the man Saul, who had once persecuted the church, has been confronted on the way to Damascus. And uh, he goes to uh, see Ananias as the Lord commanded him, and Ananias speaks to him. And in verse 18, the Bible says, Immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received forthwith and arose and was baptized. And that's all we're told in Acts chapter 9 about Paul's conversion, okay? That he went and he heard Ananias, and after he heard Ananias speaking, he was baptized. But I can tell you with assurity right now that Paul repented of his past sins, that Paul confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he did it before he was baptized. Okay, And those statements I just made are as true as the one I read in Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Now some people say, well, Brad, you just made that up. Acts 9, 18 says he was baptized, but it doesn't say anything about him repenting. It doesn't say anything about him confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, when Paul recounts his own conversion... He says that Ananias asks him the question, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Once again, repentance not mentioned. Confessing the name of Christ not mentioned. You know what else is not mentioned? Faith. But I know one thing. Paul had to believe or he wasn't going to be saved. You know how I know that? Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. So if the Bible tells me that Paul was converted and that he was ultimately baptized, I can tell you with 100% surety that not only was he baptized, but he heard the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17, that he repented of his past sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Luke 13 verse 3 says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Well, what good would baptism do if he didn't repent? I also know that he uh, confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Because if you don't confess him before uh, uh, witnesses, neither will our Father confess us before, or neither will the Christ confess us before our Heavenly Father, Matthew 10, 31 and 32. So I know these facts to be just as true, even though they weren't explicitly stated about Paul. And you can know that about me, right? I can tell you certain facts about me and you can know other things to be equally true based on that, right? If all you knew was that I was married to April, then you could find all kinds of things out about me, couldn't you? Without even talking to me, you could find out where I live because if I'm married to April, I'm going to be living at the same address April lives at. If you need my phone number or you need a phone number to contact me, you can contact April because you're most likely in, uh, going to contact me through that means. We can infer certain things to be just as equally true as the explicit statement or the fact that we know to be explicitly stated. <clears throat> so implication, when God implies it, we must infer it. But we should never infer something that God did not imply. Okay, so when the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We should note that everyone that believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we believe that, and we teach it because that's what it says. But we cannot infer from that verse that you don't have to repent. We can't infer from that verse that you don't have to be baptized. In fact, when you put the, the totality of the New Testament together, you have to infer that faith alone is dead. James chapter 2, verse 17. 
And when you put all those facts together, you can infer things that are just as true as if they were explicitly stated. Okay, now some distinctions that we need to make, and, and perhaps these will um, give us some pictures in our mind of how do we know if something is right with God and not right with God. And we have to determine between whether, uh, I've been using the word obligatory, whether something is obligatory or whether it's circumstantial. In Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16. Let's see, Acts chapter 16, verse uh, 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she at attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, with, uh, brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. That's in net, another context. Okay, so here uh, we, need, we can look at this and we can determine whether a thing involved is circumstantial or obligatory in matter. Uh, the Bible tells us that Thia, uh, Lydia was a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, her, the heart opened her, uh, the heart was opened when she heard the teaching of the truth, the Lord, uh, the word of God, and uh, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul, and when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. So, what we know to be obligatory in this particular text is based on the totality of the New Testament. We know that in order for her to be right with God, she had to hear the teaching of the truth. We know that she had to open her heart to it. She had to believe it. Okay? She had to uh, be convicted of it. She had to be converted. And then she had to be baptized, verse 15. Now these other things are just the circumstance, right? These other things are just circumstantial. This could be any person that you're talking to in anybody's house, right? And it doesn't matter if they, uh, if they have you inside of a living room or a kitchen, right? Those are circumstantial, the place where it took place. The day that it took place on, verse 13 says it took place on the Sabbath day. Is that the only day that we can sit down and have a study with an individual? No. That was circumstantial. It just happened to be the day that they met. Um, it was by the riverside. Do, do we have to meet individuals by a riverside in order to have a Bible study? No, that was just circumstantial. It just happened to be where they were. They sat down. Do you always have to sit down before you have a Bible study? Could you be talking to somebody standing up? See, these things in verse 13 and verse 14 and verse 15 show us that there were some things that just happened to be taking place at the same time as the obligatory matter. But we have to distinguish between what is obligation and what is circumstantial. And the reasoning is because some people have made the, the circumstance the, ob the obligation. They bind the circumstance. And if you bind the circumstance, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay? If you bind going by walking or by ship, when that wasn't the obligatory matter, but if you bind that, then you put a lot of people in a, in, a, in a hard way. And you've made God's law harder to obey than he wanted it to be. In Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> we can see this same idea of circumstance and obligation, but we'll go a little further and point out that there were some things that were uh, essential and some things that were incidental. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
and we used Acts chapter 20 this morning as an example, but it's a, it's a good example of example, but it's also a good example of showing that we have to make certain distinctions uh, or we're going to bind something God didn't want us to bind and we're going to loose something God didn't intend to be loosed. Notice in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, <clears throat> Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, verse 8. Now we're told about this meeting, and they came together upon the first day of the week to break bread, to partake of the Lord's Supper. Okay, That was uh, one of the intentions of coming together. We also know one of the intentions of them coming together was to hear Paul preach, because Paul preached till midnight, it says. So we know that one of the purposes was to partake of the Lord's Supper, but another purpose was to hear Paul preach. <clears throat> we know what day it was. The day was specified. It was upon the first day of the week. Now, what else was going on at the same time as upon the first day of the week, partake the Lord's Supper and hear preaching? Well, at that same time, the Bible says there were many lights. There were many lights. You know, I was preaching one time and the electricity went off and there were no lights. Now, did I have authority to continue preaching even though we didn't have any lights in the room? I certainly did. You know why? Because lights had nothing to do with me obeying this command. It was in an upper chamber. We're in trouble, aren't we? We're on the lower ground. We're on level one, right? <laughs> if you had to obey this command to worship, and by inference... If we were to infer, uh, based on the statements here, then not only did we have to take the Lord's Supper and hear preaching on an upper room, we'd have to sing, pray, give. All those acts of worship would, would need lots of light, right? Many lights. And it would have to be in an upper room. But we're not on an upper room, are we? The lights in the room just happened to be there at the same time as the obligation. The lights and the room, where the room was, had nothing to do with obeying the command. You can obey the command to partake the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week and hear preaching anywhere in the world. You can do it in a house, right? You can do it in a, a camper. You can do it outside. You can do it under a tree. You can do it out in the open. You can do it in the field. Uh, Jesus said to the woman at the well, there's a day coming and now is when, when true worshipers will come to worship God in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter the location necessarily. Right? Whether it be on that mountain or that mountain. You could be on either mountain. As long as you're obeying God, God's going to approve of it. So there is, God, Jesus was saying then, there's obligatory matters and there's some things that are not obligatory, they're incidental. They're incidental. The lights, the fan, the camera, there's lots of things that are incidental to us obeying the command. What's important, and we're about to get into this, those things don't change the command. Okay, and that's the key. Those things don't change the command. They are simply there. In fact, we might say that lights and a microphone system uh, allow us to do what God has commanded us to do, and that gets us to our next point, what an expedient is. An expedient is something that expedites or makes it more easy to do or more efficient to do, but if there's no authority for it in the first place, you cannot expedite it. Okay, does that make sense? You can't expedite something you don't have to do. You can't expedite something God didn't give us permission to do. Okay? So there are a lot of people out there today who call everything they do when you ask them for uh, Bible authority. Where do you get your authority to do this? And they say it's an expedient. That's just their way of saying... Uh, you know, it's just something we do. Uh, we don't really have to have authority. No, you have to have authority before you can have an expedient. 
Okay, so when someone says, what's your authority for an expedient? I go back to the original command. Right? So somebody might say, well, what's your authority to rent this facility? Well, the facility is an expedient. Well, I've got to prove that. Well, this uh, expedites our ability to obey the command to come together on the first day of the week, doesn't it? I'm, I'm commanded to come together on the first day of the week. Well, in order for us to do that, we need somewhere to meet. I'm commanded to sing one to another. Well, I can't sing one to another if we're not assembled together. So this, uh, this facility uh, expedites our ability to obey the command to sing. It expedites our ability to edify and, and uh, promote fellowship with one another through partaking of the Lord's Supper. This facility is an expedient, and it's authorized. It's authorized because the command, not because of what I want to do with it, but it's, uh, it's authorized based upon its expe it expedites a command. Without the command, though, I can't have the building. <laughs> right? I can't have the building without the command to assemble, to sing one to another. Okay? <clears throat> And you know, when, when we say the facility or the building, there's a lot of expedience authorized inside of that ability to it. I mean, we, we pay for air conditioning, right? Somebody might say, well, how do you authorize the, the paying of air conditioning? Well, we're, we're, uh, we're commanded to assemble. And when we're at home, God allows us to have comfortable homes to live in. And so God approves of us to have a comfortable place to assemble and worship Him, right? We have bathrooms to uh, make sure that we can be comfortable, water fountains. We have a refrigerator uh, to make sure that our grape juice stays fresh. It doesn't uh, go bad on us, and that, that expedites our ability to obey the command to partake of the Lord's Supper in an efficient manner. But what if somebody said, well, we're going to build a gymnasium right beside of our auditorium? Okay. Well... The question should be what? What's the authority? What's your authority for building a gymnasium? Well, people might say, well, we can use it for Bible classes, or we can use it for this, or we can use it for that. No. If you're going to build Bible classes, okay, then that's an expedient to obey the command to teach. I get that. I need you to tell me what's the expedient, or what's the command that authorizes a gym? Because a gym is a place where you play sports, right? I mean, that's what a gymnasium is. So you need to find a Bible authority, explicit statement or example or inference that approves of playing a sport as a part of the work of the church. And if you can do that, then the gymnasium would be an expedient, would it? But it's not an expedient because there's no command that authorizes it. So you can't just have an, say this is an expedient. You have to have a command before it's a... Uh, you, you have to have something to expedite before it be, can be called an expedient. <clears throat> uh, people have... Uh, we've heard of uh, congregations having petting zoos and all sorts of things. And they say, well, when people get there, we can teach them. No. If you want to teach something, there is a command to teach. But petting zoo is not an expedient to teach, Right? Uh, you can't make an expedient be something that it's not. That it's not. Uh, people might say, well, let's, uh, let's have a, uh, a health facility here at the building. And we'll have, uh, you know, uh, uh, r bikes that you can ride or, uh, or a sauna or something like that. Uh, and that way uh, we can encourage people to get here when they get here. We can teach them, right? No, you have to have an you have to have an obligatory thing that com, that author that is authorized before you can expedite it, and that's usually speaking, and that's the reason. Perhaps I should have done this part in the morning, but that's why this perhaps may be the most important part of the sermon. Is this is where the world and the religious world gets off the most, isn't it? By claiming something is either an expedient or a matter of opinion when they can't expedite it because there's no authority for it. 
Because just, but just saying it's an expedient doesn't make it an expedient. <clears throat> so we have to properly define those things. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, and I mean, if you look around, the denominational world has, and of course the denominational world, generally speaking, they're not interested in book, chapter, and verse. Okay? And that's generally speaking. So when you, they're not interested in Bible authority. When you ask them why they do something, they'll just tell you the truth. A big gym is good for our attendance. Or uh, we have a basketball league and, and we make a lot of money off of that basketball league. Or, or our kids really love it. Or uh, They'll tell you the reason, the real reason they do it because they don't bind themselves to what God says. When I started this sermon this morning, we, had, we wanted to ask the question, does God approve of this? Right? It's not, can I do it? Does God say not to do it? You know, uh, or what do I want to do? Because some people don't care. They basically think God allows anything they want to do as long as they call it worship. Now that's the general religious world in the denominational sense is, as long as we do it and say it's for God, we can do anything, but that's not true. So in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and verse 16, we have the Great Commission, and the command is this. The obligatory matter is, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, we have some obligatory matters, some incidentals, and inside those incidentals, expedients, right? So... The first command is go. Now we've already talked about the command to go. Paul took a boat. He walked. Right? The idea, since there's multiple ways of going and God didn't specify the, the method of going, then we can go by car, we can go by boat, we can go by plane. We can walk. Okay? That's authorized by God. The walking is the expedient to go. We're commanded to go. That's the command. Then we're commanded to teach. Preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we're, we're uh, given a specific thing to preach, the gospel. So we don't have authority to preach any other thing, do we? We, uh, we don't have uh, authority to preach out of some self-help book or what some man, some psychologist or, or um, you know, uh, motivational speaker is saying will help people. Right? That's not what we've been told to do. We've been given a command to preach the gospel. Now, does, did, the, did God limit how we preach the gospel? Well, I can get up here and I can preach a sermon, right? That's one way I can preach the gospel. I could also put a screen up on the wall and I can show you it. I can put verses on I can do PowerPoint, right? I can show things up on, on, the, on the board, up on the wall, to help you visualize these lessons. So I can teach by means of visual aid, right? So the teaching is the command. Whether I lecture or whether I show a visual aid, those are the expedients. Those are the means I use to get the job done. Okay? And I only can have an expedient for, an, for a God-authorized job. I can't make up the job that I want to do and then say this is expedient. <clears throat> then the next command was baptize, right? Now... Uh, in order to baptize, we might buy a baptistry. And somebody say, well, wh uh, what gives you the authority to buy a baptistry? Well, I'm commanded to baptize people. But I don't have to buy a baptistry, right? See, I'm not commanded to buy a baptistry. That's an expedient. I could just say, let's go down to the lake. Because I have an example of where the Ethiopian eunuch said, see, here is water. So I can meet somewhere where there's enough water to dip someone. I can meet at a hotel swimming pool, which is what we've done in the past. Right? Because that was incidental. Those were expedients. The command was to baptize. And that's what we did. And we, we did whatever we needed to do to expedite that command. <clears throat> so uh, here's some other thoughts as, as it applies to command and expedient. And then I'm going to add addition. Because... The Bible says that we're not to add or take away from the words of the Bible. If you add to God's Word, it's not God's Word anymore. Okay? 
If you take away from God's word, it's not God's word anymore. The devil, right, added, thou shalt not surely die. That was not God's word. Now somebody might say, well, some of those words were God's word. No, none of those words were God's word. God said, if you touch it or if you eat it or touch it, you'll die. And the devil said, you will not. When you change one little word, you change the whole thing. Okay? So there's a big difference between an expedient, which is authorized because of the command, and an addition, which is not authorized because the command doesn't authorize such. Okay, so let's look at a few. We mentioned baptism. Baptism is an immersion based upon its very definition. We are commanded to baptize based on Mark 16, 15 and 16. And so we said that an expedient might be uh, that we have a baptistry or that we go to a lake or that we go to a, a, a local place where there is water. Now, an addition to baptism would be to sprinkle or pour rather than to immerse. Because that's not an ex it's not an expedient, and it's anti the definition of baptism. To sprinkle or to pour is to actually change the definition of baptism. The Bible commands us to sing, Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3 verse 16. So, remember the big question. Does God approve? Does God authorize? Does God command? Well, we sing, and I can say yes. God approves of singing. How do I know? Colossians 3, verse 16, Ephesians 5, verse 19. Now, if someone wants to use a piano or an organ, they have to find an explicit statement or an example of somebody in the New Testament church using a piano or an organ as an instrument in worship. There is no command, there is no example, and therefore it's not authorized. They have, the, they, they have the same authority I do, and that's to sing. That's the only authority with regards to music and worship that we can find. Now, an expedient would be songbooks. We're to sing one to another. We need to be in order. We need to, have, we need to be singing, singing the same words and the same melody. So we buy songbooks. Those songbooks are an expedient. They help us obey the command. A piano does not help us sing. It's an addition to singing. You're singing plus playing a piano. So that's an addition. It's not an expedient. The songbook doesn't do anything, does it? It doesn't change the command to sing. When we hold a songbook, at the end of the day, all we've done is sing. We didn't sing and do something else. We just sang. We're commanded to assemble, as I pointed out just a moment ago. So we have a facility that we rent in order that we might obey the command uh, to do that facility. An addition may be, as I mentioned before, ha uh, having a gymnasium. We're commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week, right? We've used that as an example. And so an expedient would be, uh, let's buy trays so that we can put the bread in it, so that we can put the juice in it, so that we can, uh, at a convenient time, in a, uh, in a manner that is... Um, uh, um, coordinated and a way that is uh, classy everybody protect the Lord's Supper basically at the same time so we buy trays there's no explicit statement authorizing a tray right but it's an expedient to help us obey the command to take the Lord's Supper we buy plastic cups to put the juice in what right that expedites our ability to drink the juice as Jesus commanded on the first day of the week an addition would be pizza as opposed to unleavened bread. Or Coca-Cola as opposed to the grape juice. There's no authority for those things. That's what makes them wrong. Or to do it on any other day than Sunday. God specified the day. There's no other day specified. To change the day is to do something that would not please God. We're commanded to give upon the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. But we do read of people giving on days other than the first day of the week uh, in, in circumstances that were, uh, where individuals were of a need. The Bible says that some congregations gave above their means. Do you know that you're authorized to give above your means? <laughs> you don't think about that, did you? <laughs> Now, you don't have to, 
You're not commanded to give above your means. But we do have an example that says people gave above their means, which means you have the authorization to do it if you want to. Now, you're not authorized to give less than what you think you ought to be giving based upon uh, how you define that between you and God and what you prospered. But you can give more. So we're commanded to give. Our expedient might be the baskets that we use to take up the collection, right? But an addition would be a car wash. God doesn't authorize us to have a car wash to make money for the church or to have a bake sale or to raffle off tickets. Uh, this has been probably 10 years ago, but there was a quote-unquote Church of Christ that had a college football coach who was not a Christian, as a guest speaker, and uh, they were raising money. To, you could come and hear this college football coach speak, and they were giving away a Mustang that day. Now, where does that? Where do they get the authority to raise money for the church like that? I, it's shameful. If you if you love God, that would make you feel sick. Okay that somebody would do that. Those things are additions. They don't help us obey the command to give. We don't need those things. And then, of course, uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach. Mark 16, verse 15, preach. We have a nice podium here. This podium expedites our ability to, to teach, to preach. I can put my material up here in a, a nice organized way. I can put my Bibles up here, right? We can put a microphone. These things don't change the command to teach or preach. This podium does nothing. It doesn't teach or preach for me, does it? It doesn't add anything to my preaching. It just aids me. That's the same thing with a screen or a PowerPoint. And then, of course, an addition would be to preach any other gospel than we have been given, Galatians 1, 6 through verse 9. So these are just basic principles that can help us to determine if some of the nonsense that's going on in the religious world and sadly even in the Church of Christ are things that we ought to be uh, associated with. And the question should always be, does God approve? Does God authorize it? And it should never be, God didn't say not to, because that doesn't give us authority. And I want to add one other comment too, and that is uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4, I think it's in verse 14, the Bible tells us that when we separate ourselves from the world as Christians, we're going to share reproach in Christ. In other words, the world is going to reproach us because we look different than the world. We look like Christ, okay? And Peter says we ought to appreciate that reproach. We ought to gladly bear that reproach because it says we're like Christ and not like the world. In the next verse it says, though, don't suffer reproach as a murderer or an envious person. In other words, don't suffer reproach that you deserve. Okay? And I just want you to think about this in addition to does God authorize it. When we think of doing th something or saying something, we ought to think, is this going to help the church or hurt it? You know, the, the, the church of Christ, generally speaking, the church, the body of Christ, is autonomous. So each congregation governs itself. And congreg individual congregations have not had a problem uh, with getting farther and farther away from the world, have they? In other words, if they're getting reproach, it's not because they're trying to get away from the world. If you look at, the chur at churches, sadly, they're doing everything they can to get closer and closer to the denominations without actually being called a denomination. And I would add 1 Peter 4, verse 14, and say, why do we want to get as close to these divisions 
as we, as we can when we should be trying to get as far away from them as possible. In other words, I would rather be reproached for being separate from these in entities than to be lumped in with them. Now that doesn't mean that if a denomination does something that, I, that that means it's wrong necessarily and I should never do it. But I should never want to do something just because a denomination does it. And if, if what I'm about to do makes the church look like a denomination, I would think very long and hard about whether I want to do it. Why would we want to, for everybody to drive by and go, oh, they're doing the same thing as the denominations are doing? We need to be making ourselves distinct from the world. And the sad thing is, the, the Church of Christ is becoming closer and closer and closer to looking like denominations rather than being distinct separate from the world. And so I would add that in our uh, thinking. Is what I'm going to do make us look more and more like a denomination? And why would I want to do that? Why would I want to do that? When, when the Bible tells me to suffer reproach as a Christian for being separate from the world. And of course that's um, extra for no charge, okay? Because that doesn't necessarily go in with how we prove something is right from God. But I think it does. It should be in our thinking. Is what we're about to say or do going to bring reproach on the church? Is it going to make it look just like these other man-made organizations as opposed to the blood ball organization that it should be? There's a lot in this, and it took two sermons to do. And so I hope it was beneficial, and I hope that it wasn't too much at once. And I encourage you to continue studying. And I hope I have summed it up in basic terms that, at least in the basic principle of things, those things can be in our mind. And that is, in order for it to be authorized or approved of God or permitted by God, we must ask, does he authorize it? That's the question. And my grandfather... Um, I don't think he had a, his, he, I don't even know if he got to eighth grade, but he, he may have had an eighth grade education. But he was able to understand this, and he put it in a very simple way that I'll pass on to you that maybe will help you. For years and years, he would have people say, why don't you do this, or why don't you all do that, right? Why don't you add this? Why don't you think about doing that? And his response was, there ain't no Bible for it. There ain't no Bible for it. If it wasn't in the Word of God, it wasn't worth doing. If God didn't command it by, or authorize it or approve it by statement directly or by example or by implication, then that's why we don't do it. There ain't no Bible for it. If you want to do it, go find the Bible for it. Go find the Bible for it. And as I was pointing out, uh, to some just right after the sermon this morning. If there's doubt, if there's doubt as to whether something is approved of God, why would we want to take a chance on something when we have doubt? Why don't we wait until we know that it's approved of God before we act on something, right? Because that should be our number one goal. So, as has been pointed out, the command to make disciples by teaching the gospel and individuals hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel through obedience, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of past sins and being immersed in water. That's God's plan to save. That's God, God's authorized means of becoming a Christian.